which is called which is called Health Equity, Fair Global Access to Life-Saving Medicine slash Vaccines. And for those of you who aren't part of GRAN, you can get lots of information about it and all of our advocacy on our website, which you went to, I think, when you registered. So it's really a pleasure to introduce today's speaker to you. Uh, this is Dr. Pai, Madhu Pai. He's a Canadian Research Chair in Epidemiology and Global Health at McGill University, Montreal. He's the Associate Director of the McGill International TB Centre. He did his training, medical training and community medicine residency in Valor, India, and completed his PhD in epidemiology at UC Berkeley and a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California at San, in San Francisco. Madhu serves on the WHO Strategic and Technical Advisory Group for TB in the Southeast Asia region and the WHO Advisory Group on Tuberculosis Diagnos Diagnostics and Laboratory. He's a member of the Scientific Advers Advisory Committee of, of FIND Geneva. He serves as the chair of the Public-Private Mix Working Group of the Stop TB Partnership. He serves on the editorial boards of Lancet Infectious Diseases, PLOS Medicine and BMJ Global Health, among others. And he's editor-in-chief of PLOS Global Public Health. Madhu's research is mainly focused on improving the diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis, especially in high burden countries like India and South Africa. His research is supported by grant funding, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Gates Foundation, Grand Challenges Canada, and Canadian Institute of Institutes of Health Research. He has more than 300 publications and is recipient of the Union Scientific Prize, Chanchiani Global Health Research Award, Haley T. DeBass Prize, and David Johnston Faculty and Staff Award. He's a member of the Royal Society of Canada and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, Sciences. And he is a leading voice in Canada and around the world, I think, for vaccine equity. Very busy man, so we are very pleased that he is able to be with us today. So welcome, Dr. Pai. Thanks, everyone. I hope you can uh, see my slides and I'll put it on uh, full screen view for you. Is that okay? Can you hear me okay and see the slides? Yes, we can. Yeah, very good. Oh, perfect. Um, I uh, teach uh, global health at McGill uh, to young people, undergraduates primarily. And um, this is the first time I'm addressing an audience primarily made up of um, older women and grandmothers. So I'm very grateful to you for inviting me. Um, there's a lot I'm sure I, I will learn from you. So um, I think um, all of us are seeing the, the pandemic unfold. And I think uh, it, this has been a, a, a watershed moment for all of us working in global health because we are starting to see how inequities are driving this pandemic in every part of the world and how deeply entrenched inequities are um, that makes our global health work at once more relevant, but also extraordinarily challenging uh, given the geopolitics um, that drive inequities globally. I wanna kind of show this cartoon to all of you because this weighs very heavily on my mind. Uh, this is a cartoon uh, by a Canadian um, cartoonist called Graham McKay. Uh, I believe he is at the Hamilton Spectator. Uh, Graham uh, redrew his cartoon at my request um, where you know we are still in this first tsunami of COVID-19, year three of the pandemic. And then behind this first tsunami, there is a second tsunami of healthcare disruption, where because of COVID disruptions, we are not able to access healthcare for many other diseases. Things like TB have completely fallen off the rails uh, globally because of uh, COVID uh, healthcare disruption. And then behind all of that, we, have a num we are in a massive global recession uh, inflation is out of control. Millions of people are being pushed into extreme poverty. And then assuming we survive these tsunamis, there is still climate crisis looming um, and coming at us faster than we think based on all the climate reports that have come out 
uh, in the last year or two. I mean, this cartoon should really give us, all of us, uh, you know, a lot to think about. How is it that we're going to step up to the to our the biggest challenges of our time? And I do see the pandemic and climate crisis as two transnational, genuinely global catastrophic events that demand that all of us think, act, and behave like global citizens, not just as Canadians, as Americans, whatever. We are global citizens. We're citizens of planet Earth. And anything short of that kind of thinking will not see us either end the pandemic for everyone or avert uh, a climate crisis that's coming our way. Uh, I will share my slides with all of you and, and Kathy and Pat are welcome to send it out to all of you um, so that you can, you can think more about this and do more reading as well. So I wanna first talk about the direct impact of the pandemic. And I think the, there is nothing more direct than deaths. And um, we know in Canada that we've lost a lot of our seniors uh, during this uh, first wave of this crisis. And globally, if you are correct for undercounting, which is a controversial issue right now, every country pretty much has been undercounting uh, pandemic related deaths. But if you un correct for undercounting, according to The Economist uh, magazine, we are right now somewhere at 21 million deaths if you used the midpoint of the correction. Officially, the world says 6 million dead people. Um, if you do the correction, it's about uh, three and a half times that number, 21 million people um, dead globally. And all of us know somebody or the other that we've lost. That is like uh, the direct devastating impact of this pandemic. And even with this uh, direct impact, there is this myth floating around that somehow low and middle income countries have been spared that the worst devastation has happened in the global north among the richest countries in the world. And this is completely untrue. And one way to understand why this is untrue is to start looking at inequities in COVID testing. All of us here in Canada have either undergone a PCR test or have a test lying at home that we can use. But this is far from reality for a lot of low and middle income countries. In fact, please look at the tests per capita uh, in the African continent. Um, there's dramatic under testing in many parts of the world. The under testing could be as much as 50 to 90 fold, uh, six to 90 fold, depending on the low income countries. So when you don't test, you don't know, and you dramatically come up with a different picture. That's one reason why there is this myth that say Africa is spared or low income countries are doing well. Um, secondly, undercounting of debts. Undercounting of debts in many low-income countries um, happens because of the very poor uh, vital registration system. And in some countries, there is even deliberate suppression of, uh, of counting of COVID debts because the leaders in these countries don't want to look bad. And, and even in Canada, there's been uh, quite a bit of undercounting of uh, COVID deaths in provinces like Alberta. And again, this is driven by politics rather than a, than a genuine um, resource gap in, in our setting. So here is a series of graphs which illustrate to you. On the first, on the left side, if you take the official death count that countries are reporting, and if you map it, then yes, Africa doesn't look all that bad, low and middle income countries and global South countries don't look very bad. But then if you do the correction, the economist kind of a model which corrects for the undercounting, and if you use the midpoint of the economist model, then you start to see so much more red in the global South, which I think is far closer to reality than the naive estimate of, of 6 million dead and, and there, the global south doesn't look that badly impacted. And I want to give you India 
as one of the most telling examples of how devastating this pandemic has been in the global south. On paper, the Indian government claims only about 500,000 people have died. But when you correct for the undercounting, that's the economist model that we just spoke about, India may have lost as many as 5 million rather than 500,000. 5 million dead people just in one country is how devastating this pandemic has been. And I cannot tell you how traumatic it has been for me sitting here to watch this pandemic devastate uh, my other country, India. Last April, around this time, actually, uh, India went into a profound crisis because of the Delta wave. Uh, the Delta variant just ravaged the country and suddenly everybody we knew in India, friends, family members, everybody was dealing with COVID. Hospitals were full. The health system completely collapsed. The country was gasping for oxygen because that's how deadly uh, the Delta variant is. Um, and when the dust, uh, dust is settling down, just during three months of last year, April, May, and June, three months, India may have lost close to 3 million people in three months. Um, I have no words to, to explain to you how deeply uh, traumatic um, that experience has been. And so even today, the Indian government refuses to acknowledge the death toll. Um, but those of us who've been through it, those of us who lost people, we will uh, bear witness to the true devastation of this, of this pandemic. So this is just to illustrate how terrible this pandemic is. And please don't believe people who tell you that the global South countries have, have done well. That is, I think, a complete lie that does not match with reality. Now, let's talk about the indirect impact. COVID-19 is destroying years of progress in global health and poverty reduction. I have invested the last two decades of my life fighting TB. And it has been traumatic to watch 10 years of progress just vanish in a, in a two year time period. Um, along the same way, people working in every aspect of global health are seeing all their hard work get undone because of COVID-19, um, direct impact, uh, lockdowns, restrictions, and other measures that have been put in place to deal with it. Take a look at the data here. World Bank is estimating that the pandemic may have pushed 100 million people into extreme poverty. Now we are talking about extreme poverty uh, as, as defined as less than $2 a day uh, income level. And no surprise here, the biggest devastation will always happen in developing economies because they're not starting with the big GDP to begin with. And um, the UN uh, estimates that developing economies may have lost $12 trillion due to this pandemic. Again, we have, as a uh, Canadian government, invested a lot to keep our economy going. So has most high-income countries, but then developing countries are devastated uh, because of these economic losses. The pandemic has been a massive setback in the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria. I'll talk more about that in a few seconds. Um, uh, the failure to fight the pandemic has caused record fall in life expectancy, rising poverty, widening inequality. And of course, it will affect every area of global health, maternal and child health, childhood nutrition, malnutrition, mortality, so on and so forth. So here is a great example of how devastating this pandemic has been. Um, estimates suggest that routine childhood vaccination rates, I'm talking about polio, measles, uh, rubella, MMR, vaccines that are very standard, straightforward bread and butter for most countries. Um, we've lost almost 15 years of progress in just child, routine childhood vaccination coverage. And I'm so scared that all this uh, rising tidal wave of anti-vaccine sentiments are also percolating into uh, impacting routine childhood vaccination coverage. And that would be absolutely devastating for Global South countries. 
Um, we do not want to see measles come back and kill children. We cannot afford to have polio come back. So this is a massive area um, for us to be worried about in future. TB, um, believe it or not, um, you know, uh, I wrote this piece for Forbes. Please look at the date on it. I wrote it in March 17 of 2020. Right at the start of the pandemic, I had warned that TB is going to get damaged. And then I had said we need a damage control plan. Well, everything I had predicted not only turned out to be true, it actually turned out to be worse than what I had imagined in my, in my mind when I wrote that piece uh, in March of 2020. So here is a paper that we published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's free access to any of you. And I will also put the link in the, in the chat box if you wish on how devastating this pandemic has been for tuberculosis. Um, and I wrote this along with colleagues at the World Health Organization. So in short term, out of the 10 million people uh, estimated to be affected uh, with TB in 2020, we could only pick up 5.8 million. We now have 4.1 million people who are considered missing. Either people who completely not diagnosed during this crisis or not reported to any uh, TB program. And so the missing uh, gap in TB has become substantially worse during this pandemic. Globally, we've had about a 20% reduction in case, cases diagnosed. And that's not because TB has disappeared, it's because people have not have had a chance to access healthcare services. Uh, TB testing rates have gone down because its uh, staff and labs have been diverted to COVID testing. And India is one of the worst impacted countries. India was already the world's highest TB burden countries, but now India has missed too many people with TB during the last two years. And that's basically what I'm showing in this graph as well. India has had three huge waves. Wave one was one of the most uh, restrictive lockdowns. Wave two is a devastating Delta variant that I spoke about. And India has just recovered from a big Omicron uh, variant. And during each wave, you can see cases, TB cases detection just plummeted downwards and it slowly limps back. And another wave happens, another dip happens. So overall, India has lost several years of progress in TB and India being the world's highest TB burden country means that the world is now going to miss all our 2030 uh, sustainable development goal targets for TB. And the World Health Organization reported for the first time uh, last year, we've actually seen an increase in TB mortality. You can see the curve trending upwards because of the pandemic. And mathematical models show that even without COVID, we would have struggled to meet the 2030 NTB goals. But now with COVID, we're actually going to see a worsening of the TB epidemic. We're going to see a, a surge in the number of cases and deaths. And then we'll have to work very hard to bend the curve and bring it back. And I think at this point, um, I'm, I'm uh, pretty sure we will not meet the 2030 uh, NTB targets it looks pretty much impossible um, at this point, given how much uh, the pandemic has worsened due to, due to COVID-19. So to me, whether it's TB, whether it's AIDS, whether it's malaria, whether it's childhood vaccination, I do not see any hope to recover any aspect of global health if we do not vaccinate the world. That is why for me, COVID vaccine equity is truly been uh, one of the most important things that the world could, should have done and prioritized, but has failed to do. And I've been relentlessly uh, pointing out this problem in op-ed after op-ed, media interview after another, that we must vaccinate the world. Otherwise we'll end up playing whack-a-mole with variants. And this is exactly what we are doing right now. And look at the shameful um, gap between low income country vaccination coverage and where we are in Canada and in the highest income countries in the world. I mean, this is um, you know absolutely shameful that almost a year and a half later, 
we've left behind so many countries and, and we're giving way more booster doses in high income countries now than we are giving primary doses in the lowest income countries. So here we are in Canada. I'm sure all of you have had a third dose as, ha as have I. Even my child here, who's 14 years old, has been lucky enough to get a booster shot. Uh, but I'm just appalled at how poorly uh, we have supported low-income countries. And then all of this results in this uh, really striking graphic of nearly 3 billion people around the world, primarily in the global south, still waiting for their first dose. Only 15% of the population in low-income countries have even received one dose. I mean, with this kind of a massive blind spot, how will new variants not emerge? We're already seeing BA2 take off like a rocket, BA.4, BA.5, we have seen recombinants. This is a recipe for disaster that when we forget one third of the world's population and pretend that they don't exist, we're gonna be paying for this uh, blind spot for a long time to come. Again, I, I suggested uh, Graham McKay to draw a cartoon about this, which he did. I mean, we are trying to put out a deal with one variant and one wave at a time, but we do not seem to understand that there is no such thing as protecting just Canada, protecting just America, protecting just Ontario. We've got to have a global vision to end this pandemic. This pandemic ends only when it ends for everybody everywhere. And that means we've got to share vaccines, rapid tests, antiviral medicines, and everything that is necessary for people to protect themselves. So I'm just um, uh, really sad to, to see how badly we've done with this vaccine equity. And then um, this is a piece that uh, uh, I have put already in the chat box. Uh, we published in, this, in the Atlantic magazine. I hope you will all read it because we are starting to see a very, very predictable and familiar pattern. And that is HIV, um, TB and malaria were once very common in the global North, in the highest income countries, including Canada. I'm sure all of you know that in your own lifetime, I'm sure you've seen uh, TB. Um, you know, when you were much younger, you would have seen TB here. Even now there's a lot of TB in the Inuit communities in Canada, but the minute um, our TB rates or HIV rates or malaria rates went down, the global North declared success and, and forgot about these infections. And they've all become endemic, quote unquote, in the global south, where they continue to be devastating even today. So we wrote this piece to share our anxiety that COVID might become another TB, AIDS and malaria, that it will continue to ravage global south countries for many, many more years to come because we've simply failed to protect these countries, share vaccines and, and, and medicines and other resources that countries need in order to deal with it. And so here we are in the global north pretending the pandemic is over for us, um, declaring that it's time to move on and declaring that somehow endemic means good um, and, 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 and also making statements like it's too late to, to vaccinate the world. Uh, this is a very, very dangerous way of thinking about it. And that's why we wrote this piece to draw attention to the parallels between what we are seeing with COVID-19 and what we've seen historically with AIDS, TB, and malaria. And look what happens when a disease becomes endemic in the global south. People are misusing the term endemic to mean that everything is okay. It's far from okay. HIV AIDS is endemic now in sub-Saharan Africa where it's killing millions of people even today. Look at tuberculosis, again endemic. In, in Asia, in, in uh, Latin America and, and uh, the African continent, again, killing 1.5 million people a year. And look at malaria. Again, it's endemic to the uh, African continent where it's killing hundreds and thousands of children even today. So we don't want endemic infections killing people and we do not want to see endemic as a good outcome. We want to be able to address these infections wherever they occur in the world. 
And that's what we are failing to do. Our myopia around vaccine nationalism will pretty much condemn, I worry, the global South countries to many more years of COVID over and about TB, AIDS, malaria, and everything else that these countries are dealing with. The, the CEO of Global Fund, Peter Sands, um, said it best that HIV, TB, and malaria are pandemics that have been beaten in rich countries. Allowing them to persist elsewhere is a policy choice and a budgetary decision. This is the exact decision that high-income countries have made. They've decided that it is okay for COVID-19 to ravage poorer countries for many more years to come, that it is okay for low-income countries to not have access to vaccines. It's okay for people there to die of COVID-19. This is the kind of decisions that our leaders in rich countries have made um, and made um, knowing fully well that they could have chosen a different path uh, in terms of where we could have done and done better. And look at the, uh, the, uh, you know, the lack of any equity. Tuberculosis has been ravaging low and middle income countries for years. And yet, since 1882, we've only had one vaccine for TB. And that vaccine is still used even today. And that's the BCG vaccine. Some of you may have received BCG as children. I received BCG when I was born in India. That vaccine is exactly 100 years old. It was um, people in the Pasteur Institute in France came up with that in 1921. So in 2021, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of a vaccine that does not work well. And look at the investments made in COVID-19. Hundreds of billions of dollars were spent on COVID vaccines and dozens of COVID vaccines have been manufactured, billions of doses have been delivered, and yet we think it's okay for TB to not have a good vaccine, it's okay to use a 100-year-old vaccine, but it's okay to underinvest so much in such an important infectious disease. And you ask yourself, why, why is there this kind of a thinking in global health? And I have come to a point in my life where after seeing what I have in the last two years, I don't think resources or science is the rate limiting step for ending TB or any global health challenge that you care about. I think the biggest problem is us, the way our value system works and our lack of imagination, our lack of ambition, I think is a much, much bigger issue than money or science or technology. Because we saw with COVID, everything is possible if we wanted to do it. And I think uh, the late Paul Farmer probably said it best. He wrote in one of his book, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. We inherently seem to value black and brown people's lives as being less worthy, that we are willing to accept a much higher death toll, that we are willing to accept a low vaccine coverage, we're willing to set the bar very low for people in low and middle income countries, but for ourselves, we expect a lot. We expect the best, we expect immediate access, we expect plenty of supply of vaccines, antivirals and tests, but somehow we think it's okay for low income countries to not have access to any of the stuff that we have access to. And more recently, Dr. Yodi Alakija, who is a, a wonderful African uh, advocate and, and WHO envoy, she was interviewed by the New York Times a month ago, where uh, New York Times asked her, so how do we achieve vaccine equity? Uh, and Yodi said, we will achieve it when we ascribe the same values to lives in the global South as we do to lives in the global North. To me, this is one of the most important things that anyone working in global health must understand. And something that Paul Farmer has been talking and writing about for decades, that if we do not value lives of our brothers and sisters and colleagues in the global South, as much as we value our own lives, then we will never truly make progress with global health equity. And so this is a picture from two weeks ago. I went back to India for the first time since the pandemic started. Uh, I'm so thrilled that my mother, who's 83 years old, 
uh, was alive. She, uh, she had uh, Omicron, but she recovered quickly because she was double vaccinated. And I, and I told, I, I asked myself, so my mom was so lucky um, that, that she could access vaccines early in the pandemic and that she could survive. But um, what about other moms? Don't other moms need to, to, to have a similar chance? What about a 80 year old mom in the African continent? Barely 15% of the African continent is vaccinated. How, how would you feel if you had a mom on the African continent who's unvaccinated, right? This is the, the lack of, uh, you know, in our, in, and the way we think about it. I don't want my mom to be special. I want all moms everywhere in the world, dads, everybody, to have equal access to life-saving technologies like the vaccines. And I don't think it's impossible. It is very, very possible, but we've not made it possible. Hands down, we could have put the money on the table, even when the G7 met last year, they had a terrific opportunity to vaccinate the world. It would have cost barely 50 billion at that point. They could have easily put the money on the table, vaccinated the world, ended this carnage and devastation and prevented new variants. And yet we, including Canada, walked away from that deal. The Economist magazine called it the deal of the century. That's how much it would have paid off if we had invested in it. And yet we walked away from the table, we did nothing. And we are still dealing with the crisis three years later. And Canada, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to say this. I'm so ashamed. I'm truly ashamed and I'm appalled by what we've done. I expected more from our country. I'm not willing to accept that this is the kind of people we are. And so there is a massive gap in Canada between our intent and outcomes. Our prime minister was on Rosemary Barton's show last Christmas. And that was the last question Rosemary asked him. And what are you waiting for to see whether this pandemic will get better or not? And he said, I'm interested in making sure people have access to vaccines all over the world. And yet his own government has only shared 15 million doses so far. It's a drop in the bucket. I just told you 3 billion people are unvaccinated and we only shared 15 million doses out of the 200 million we've pledged. And we've never come out and supported the TRIPS waiver, which would have allowed vaccine manufacturing to happen in, in all countries that wanted to. We will soon have millions of vaccine doses expiring because that's how much we have hoarded. We've hoarded way more than what we ever needed. Nobody here is wanting the vaccine anymore. And we're all going to throw away those vaccines when we could have, should have donated them much, much earlier and our international reputation is in the mud. We are known as a nation of vaccine holders. That's what our international reputation is. I'm so appalled. And I've spoken to MPs, I've spoken to former ministers, I've written articles about it. In fact, I'm appearing in the Canadian parliament next week where they've invited me as a witness. They're doing a study on vaccine equity a study on vaccine equity in year three of the pandemic? What the hell? I mean, really, what the hell? Is this a time to do a study when you're gonna have millions of vaccines expiring in shelves and freezers? Come on. This is just absolutely appalling. This shows myopia of a nature that I'm just absolutely shocked. This is not what Canada uh, should stand for. And I think all of you, and that is my uh, plea to all of you, as mothers, grandmothers, as people who have a voice, please push very hard our government to do what is morally, ethically, scientifically the right thing to do. And if you want ammunition on why vaccine equity is so critical, please read this article we just published in the British Medical Journal on why it is not too late to achieve global vaccine equity. And please, please, please use your voice, your power, and convince as many Canadians as possible to write to our MPs and our ministers. They need to hear from us. They need to understand 
that we are not happy to be a, a country of vaccine holders, that we want to be a generous country, and we certainly cannot and should not allow millions of vaccine doses to expire uh, in the coming weeks. Those should be in the arms of my mother, somebody else's mother. They should have already been delivered to countries. We should have, at a minimum, already given the 200 million that we pledged last year. And the fact that we've only given 15 million is absolutely shameful. And that's some, not something that any of us should be tolerating. So with that, I will stop and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Paz. Um, I'm going to uh, actually thank you for this amazing presentation. It uh, wakes us all up, I think, about just how exactly it is. Um, we do have some questions, and it's very nice that you will be happy to do this for us. So um, the first question I have is there is continuing research and development of oral anti antiviral drugs. Uh, would the availability of these drugs have a positive impact on less developed countries and healthcare systems? So again, sadly, the Pfizer antiviral pill, even Canadians are struggling to access, access the medicine. So it is nowhere close to being available in the global South countries. And it will not be available if Pfizer holds on to it, because we already saw Pfizer is not a company that's capable of generosity. And that is not the way the corporate big pharma works. Unless the, the antiviral recipe is given to many countries to manufacture on their own, like HIV medicines where 20 years ago, we will not see access. So that's exactly the problem. We have the tools right now but the tools are so inequitably distributed that we are allowing one third of humanity to, to struggle. And that is where new variants are gonna come. I guarantee you another wave, another variant is headed our way. It is merely a matter of time. Um, also, there's the logistical challenges of getting the vaccines. Um, I actually lived in Ghana and um, we, we have returned there and like in the bush way in the north of the country, it's very difficult, never mind keeping things cold, but even getting them there in a, a, a positive way. And then what about the syringes? What about people to put the needles in the arms? And do you have anything, that, like Dr. Farmer always talked about that, how you would get, you have the medication, but how do you deliver it? And how do you keep the doses there and help the people to take them on time and so on? Do you have something to say about that? Absolutely. So in addition to donating doses, um, countries like Canada should also give money, right? And that money will help buy syringes, will pay for staff and stuff and space and all of that stuff. Absolutely. And I think there was a lot of discussion about the recently announced budget, right? I'm sure many of you are tracking what Canada's contribution uh, will be to our, um, our development assistance. Um, I don't know how much has changed, but traditionally Canada's contribution to development assistance has been the lowest among the G7 countries. And I'm not sure where we've managed to bump that number up substantially to make a dent. So we, we've not shown up I think when in the, if you look at it from a perspective of even our peers within the G7, we're not contributing as much in terms of development assistance, in terms of dollars. But also I want to point out um, something that should be very obvious to us, but is not. I often hear this argument now, oh, but uh, Africa has vaccine hesitancy. Did mm -hmm. we not have vaccine hesitancy in Canada? Did we not take a year to build vaccine confidence and reach the 80% coverage that we have today? Why is it that we don't show the same grace to all countries to have enough vaccine supply to in order to build confidence? My, the, my point is supply needs to come first. Without a, a short supply of vaccines, 
nobody can build confidence in the population, right? If, if you and I didn't have access to vaccines in Canada, what is the point in having an advocacy campaign for vaccination? Or if the vaccine supply is erratic, or if you're given vaccines with a one month expiration on them, which country can manage to pull off miracles in terms of delivering the vaccines? My point is rich countries have a lot of vaccine hesitancy. Look at America. Even now, a third of Americans don't want the, the shot, right? And, and that doesn't mean America doesn't have vaccine supply. Vaccine supply should not be linked to vaccine hesitancy. Vaccine hesitancy is something every country needs to work through. They need time and resources to be able to solve it, just as if we had time and resources to solve it. I think we should make sure all countries have supply, give them a shot. It might take them a year, let them take the time and build the supply and the confidence. Now, things like uh, cold chain. I mean, here again, how did countries end up uh, eliminating polio? Virtually all parts of the world have managed, except one or two, have managed to get rid of polio. How, did, how, how was that possible? All countries, poor countries, have vaccine capability. They can deliver vaccines in the remotest bush in this, in this world, but they should be given supply and they should be given resources to do so. So I would not, I would not doubt the ability of low-income countries to deliver vaccines because they've done it successfully for polio, smallpox, measles, and a whole host of things. What I'm um, upset about is that we have not allowed low-income countries a chance to manufacture for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is a dramatically different ask. So, so even now, you know, when in global health, when we think about global health, we all think in terms of charity. And I think that is the wrong model to really think about. In 2022, global health should not be about trickle-down charity from rich countries to the poor. We should flip this and say, what is it that people need in order to manufacture and make their own products and survive? If you look at countries that have manufactured vaccines, they've all done better, right? India has manufactured, China has manufactured, Cuba has manufactured, these countries have all achieved higher vaccination coverage than others. To me, this is a watershed moment in history. When the next pandemic comes, nobody should be waiting for donations from Canada. They should be able to manufacture their own vaccines and tests and whatnot. That is true justice. Charity is not justice. So even in our own minds, we are all well-intentioned but we all come from a position of great privilege. You and I are all very privileged to be Canadians, to have resources, to have money, to have access to healthcare and, and, a, and, and a high income country that protects us when we need it. And, and as much well-intentioned as we are, our privilege does not allow us to understand that charity is not what is critical. True empowerment, and self-reliance by countries is what we should be advocating for as allies. So I hope um, you will all read another piece that I read, wrote recently on allyship in global health. Allyship truly requires us to stop thinking as saviors, right? Certainly, you know, um, move away uh, from this white saviorism model of global health to one where our job is to make sure we are good allies to people at the front line, wherever they happen to be, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Syria, whether it's vaccine equity, whether it's uh, HIV in Africa, we wanna be allies to people who are truly knowledgeable and fighting at the front lines. And how can we be good allies is what the piece is all about. That's great. Could you, um, when you have a chance, could you put that in the chat and then people can go and uh, follow the link. And uh, so we did have a question about the vaccine hesitancy and you've answered it very well. So thank you for that. And we have another question. Pat has asked us, um, Canada has made some investments and some sharing, uh, obviously way too little. Uh, what should we actually be asking them to do? Like, How should we phrase that when we write a letter or draw so, their attention? Um, 
I have uh, written plenty of letters to our prime minister and copying all the relevant ministers. Uh, our School of Population and Global Health, which I am part of, all of us pretty much signed the, the letter. We've sent it to the prime minister's office. Uh, if you look at one Canada website, they have a simple letter to, to the development minister and, 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 and Minister Sajjan and others that you can easily use a click of a button and send a letter. So at a minimum, if each of you can, can write to your MP, right? And say, as um, a, a, a citizen of your riding, um, I'm not happy that Canada has only contributed 15 million doses that we've not even reached our pledge of 200 million. I'm not happy that we've not backed the TRIPS IP waiver that more than 100 countries have backed, that without manufacturing of vaccines and tools around the world, we will not end this pandemic, nor will we tackle the next pandemic. So I'm happy to post in the chat box our letter that we have posted as an open letter. You're welcome to copy paste and, and, and run with it. And certainly you can write one letter as grand advocacy, as a group. You can do a group letter. We've done that. You can also send individual emails to your uh, MPs. The more people write to our elected politicians, the more I think there will be some momentum there. But I was just um, alarmed that they're just doing a study in the, in the Foreign Affairs Committee. Can you believe in the third year we're doing research on whether vaccine equity is necessary and whatnot? I don't understand where this is coming from. It's a big waste of money, isn't it? That could it's go to something. It's a big waste of time and money and we yeah. could have invested that money. And now imagine if we, uh, if we dump millions of doses of vaccines that we could have donated. That is just absolutely shameful. Every dose dumped could have been a life saved. Even one dose of the vaccine can do yes. dramatic things to save somebody's life, right? And, and we somehow, we delayed it, we delayed it, we delayed it. In fact, I believe since January, we've done zero pretty much in terms of uh, vaccine donations. We've literally gotten frozen. We are paralyzed as a country. Okay, forget donations then. Maybe it's dead already because it's too late. Can we not at least come out and back the TRIPS waiver so that mm -hmm. everybody can manufacture their own vaccines, right? A hundred countries have done it. We've stayed silent. We've just completely stayed silent as a country. I don't understand. I just don't, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond puzzled. And the disconnect between what our prime minister says and what has actually happened bothers me so much, right? It's like words are cheap, right? Intent is not what we should be rewarding. Outcomes is what we should be rewarding. And when it comes to outcome, our government has failed. Right, right. Okay, so um, well, you, there's a question here from Cynthia. Where can we find out how many COVID vaccine doses countries have donated versus how many they've pledged? Uh, so COVAX um, is the agency where, it, uh, with, where all of this is tracked. And you can also see that on Our World in Data, which has a special tracker. Our World in Data is already, already tracking uh, vaccine donations. For Canada, that number is posted on our government website. So I'm um, just posting for you the letter that we sent in January to uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, if, uh, if this letter uh, is something you would like to uh, adapt and send as Grand uh, Network, that could work. Uh, many other schools in Canada have used our letter and sent their own letter to Prime Minister's office. Um, so we're hoping that all of this will result in some kind of a mass movement to convince our leaders to, to act on it. Um, are there any key pressure points that the, where, in the Canadian government that we could push? I mean, I've spoken to um, a Liberal Party. I've spoken to NDP. Um, it just seems that with the with the minority government, it might be helpful to have multiple parties bring this up. I know the mm -hmm. NDP has been raising this in the parliament quite a bit, um, and now that NDP and Liberals are working together better, um, maybe this is the this is the time to actually do something about it. 
And if any of you have uh, a reach or contact with the Minister Sajjan's uh, office, the development minister, um, that might uh, help a lot as well. Okay. I, I'm That's... just also worried that uh, the Ukraine crisis has completely deflated and mm -hmm. removed this off everybody's radar, right? Nobody now is even talking about COVID. Um, and this feeling that it's all over, right? The pandemic is over. That's also having a devastating uh, impact on, on vaccine equity. So we are struggling with multiple things and, and this is falling lower and lower and lower on the, on the mm -hmm. priority list is what I'm, I'm worried about. Well, your talk like this today really helps us to understand a lot more and, uh, and to bring our awareness forward. Um, so we have a question here. Why can you tell us why the Canadian government doesn't support the TRIPS waiver? Like, why would it hurt them? So again, uh, I've I've thought a lot about this. I've spoken to a lot of people. My um, hunch says that the pharma uh, lobby has been very active. Um, and I heard, and there's a nice piece in Toronto Star, that because of intense big pharma lobbying of our leaders, it has had an impact even on our domestic pharma uh, <laughs> bill, right? So we have failed to, the Liberal government has not acted on the, on the domestic drug pricing control issue. And then internationally, we have not failed, we have failed to back the TRIPS advocacy uh, waiver. And I think both are uh, inherently related. So that is the big worry that the government is, uh, okay. is listening more to pharma execs than people like us. Okay, and how do we respond to Minister Sajjan who expresses great concern about the lack of vaccine equity, but argues that the biggest obstacle is not lack of vaccine doses, but lack of health system capacity to immunize people. We kind of talked about that. Yeah, that so then why wouldn't we do more in terms of sending money for, mm -hmm. for uh, health mm -hmm. system strengthening, right? And there again, we've not done enough. So, so to me, you know, talking about all of this seems like a lot of whataboutism, right? What about this? What about that? But we've not done what we could have done. My mm -hmm. biggest concern is we failed to donate when it, there was a desperate need. And now we are coming to a stage in a pandemic where we are struggling to do it. And we will soon have millions of doses expiring. That's where we are at in, the, in, the, in terms of the trajectory of the pandemic. Um, Pat is asking, could we somehow attend the committee in support of your presentation? I'm not sure how this works. This is the first time I've been invited to, mm. to the parliament. So it was an invitation I received and they had to then now do some vetting and then they had to uh, have me do you know tech checks and, and whatnot. Um, but it is telecast apparently. So I will find the link and, and I'll send it to you. Um, but there's no reason why um, all of you could not advocate or ask to be witnesses um, uh, in this. Um, you know, as advocates, I'm sure you understand how the Canadian government works better than I do. Uh, but this is something uh, I think we could all do. I know Robin Waite at, uh, at Results Canada has appeared uh, in, the, in, in front of this committee as a, as a witness. Oh, that's great. Uh, somebody says that we shouldn't be polite when we talk to the parliament. <laughs> so that's a comment more than a question. And Phyllis says that she's put the article about the allyship on the Grand Facebook page. So that's another source for people. And Hillary says, Big Pharma seems to have a more powerful voice with our parliamentarians than the NGOs. Any advice on shaming pharma into vaccine equity? I know it, it worries me a lot. I had somehow imagined, uh, we, I think all of us know that Big Pharma has enormous influence on US politicians, right? Just like the gun lobby. And, and Cindy, mm -hmm. can, Cindy is the expert here uh, on that, on how difficult it is um, in the American context. And I had kind of naively assumed that um, Canadian leaders were a little bit more, um, what shall I say, um, thoughtful about how to deal with uh, pharma, but I'm starting to worry and wonder whether that was the right assumption I had made. Uh, maybe we are as susceptible as, as politicians in the US 
was just not very visible to us. So if, if any of you are, in, are interested in drug pricing, for Canadians, right? The, the domestic pharma issue, I think we will end up fighting the same sorts of uh, pharma lobby, even in, in the domestic uh, issue. And, and I, I worry, although our drug prices in Canada are not outrageous like America, uh, I worry that we may still need to, you know, make sure it doesn't uh, fall behind and we end up with the paying $500 per insulin the kind of crazy situation that our American friends and colleagues go through. Okay, so uh, the, there aren't really any more questions, um, but we've got some things in the chat if people want to look. There's the piece in the Atlantic that you put the link to, Dr. Pai, and uh, Cynthia's book. It, there is a little comment that Cynthia put in there about her book, if people want to look at that and take the information. And um, I will hand it over to Pat now. And thank you so much for your great answering of all these questions. It's been very helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Pai. Your passion um, for this issue, I think, has really inspired a lot of us. We are great letter writers. Uh, we are great at calling our MPs and trying to get meetings. We have a group of grands who are actually very close to Minister Sajjan's uh, constituency and they're trying for a meeting, but we will definitely use uh, the tools and the ideas that you uh, have put forward. I really love your description of the importance of allyship, which is where I think we all NGOs in the Canadian context need to meet, uh, move to. Uh, so I really appreciate this. And I know we are going to follow up on your actions. We do have one call to action that we'd like to move forward with, which is a letter to edit the editor that we will ask everyone to pick up and write. And I'm sure, sure with your inspiration and your passion, um, we, will, we will get people moving on this. So thank you so very much. We really appreciate your time. Know how busy you are. Uh, and thank you for all the work you've done on this issue over the last two years. Very, very much appreciated, Dr. Pai. Thank you. And, and, and please continue the good work you're doing. It's really important to, and, and as, as uh, mothers and grandmothers, you have a big voice. So please, please push ahead. Vaccine equity, inequity is just one among many things we need to be dealing with but I see this as absolutely fundamental because without this, I can't see how we can recover TB, how we can recover malaria. Everything is languishing and will continue to languish. Just imagine if there was another uh, more severe variant coming our way in the coming months. Uh, I don't think we have the stomach for another bad variant. And, and I think if we don't do anything now, we will see more variants and waves and global health will continue to flounder. So that's why I, I genuinely believe vaccinating the world is bare minimum we should all be aspiring to do. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm gonna ask everybody to quickly turn on their cameras if they can, so we can all wave our thanks. There are many thank yous in the chat, but if you're able to put your camera on quickly, I'd uh, just like to say thank you. I don't know if Janet is able to take a quick screenshot uh, if she is, that would be great. And uh, again, if you don't mind, so I'll take a screenshot and post it on social media. Oh, if please do. It. Please do. That would be great. Are we ready, everyone? Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Janet here, my screen only only allows me to take about 20 people at a time because uh, I'm on a Mac. So I'm just gonna. Well, maybe we could uh, we could get a copy of, if you're gonna put it on social media, we'll definitely retweet it with our big thank you for this great session. Yes. That's thank you. So can we all say thank you and goodbye? We will take action for sure. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks everyone. Bye. Please Goodbye. stay safe.